Hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Can you see the screen OK? My name is Razvan Pistola, and I represent the startup AIception. And today, I'm going to have a presentation, a very hands-on presentation, and I hope that you can join me, about the natural language processing, machine learning, and if we have time and passion, we can also try a bit of deep learning. OK? Um, can you tell me a bit about you guys? How many of you are passionate about artificial intelligence? OK, OK, passionate about artificial intelligence. Um, how many of you actually work with machine learning or artificial intelligence in their day-to-day -day life? OK, and how many study? OK, and how many would like, that, like in the near future to begin working as a data scientist, machine learning engineer? Um, OK, great, great. So um, I have made uh, some uh, code available, if you can follow the short URL or um, the GitHub page. And uh, let's begin. Uh, you still haven't? OK. Don't worry. It will be here. OK. <coughs> so um, how many of you have heard about um, notebooks? They're a very handy way of uh, writing code and running code. And um, when doing research, they're Super useful. Don't worry. So the problem we're trying to solve right now is called in academia text classification. So you are giving a, a bit of text and a label, and you need to learn the correlation between that text and the label. Um, why is it useful? Because for example, you can detect whether an email is spam or not spam. You can uh, read an IMDB comment or review automatically and decide whether this is a positive comment or a negative comment. This is also called sentiment analysis. Um, when reading a news article, is it a sports article? Is it about religion? Or um, when you are building a chatbot, uh, you need to understand uh, what content uh, the user is typing to you. Is he insulting your chatbot or is he greeting your chatbot? And you can do all of this using text classification. So let's begin with something very simple called the bag of words model. Uh, have, how many of you have heard about bag of words? It's a very common model. OK, OK, some of you. So the idea is this. You have a text that is made up of a bunch of words. But we know that the order in which you say the words matter. But what if it wouldn't matter? What if we take all the words, we don't care about their position, and we just treat them as a set, like a bag of words? That is simple. Why is it simple? Because um, machines can't actually work with text directly. They need to transform it somehow. They need to transform it into a uh, feature space. And by using a bag of words model, we will see very easily how we can make this transformation happen. We will be using um, uh, scikit-learn. It is a uh, machine learning framework for Python. So I'm importing a count vectorizer. And I have two sentences, two documents. Ana are măr și măr și măr și altă propoziție este măr și păr. So we have these two, pro, uh, uh, two sentences, and we will just do a fit transform of these two sentences. So the count vectorizer will fit transform these two sentences. The output, it says it is a spart matrix. Doesn't sound very interesting. But if we say two array, it will give us a dense array of what it has counted. So we can see that this proposition was transformed into this vector. How come? Well, you see that apple here appear three times. 
So it decided that in the second position, in the, uh, sorry, in the third position, it put the count three for the apple. And uh, why do we have a zero here in a second? What the count vectorizer has done was this. It has created a vocabulary. A vocabulary is each of our words appearing exactly one. So it is a set of all our words. So we have the word ana, are, mer, shi, per, right? So it has decided to give all of these uh, words an ID, and it has created a vocabulary. And, what, and the second step that it has done, it has counted how many times a word appeared. So for um, index zero, it said, OK, Anna appeared once. For are, which is this index, it said, OK, it appeared once in the first proposition, which is true, right? Anna, are. Looking at the second proposition, we do not have Anna or are. Yes, we, do, we have zero for Anna, we have zero for are. And it keeps doing this, right? So you can imagine I would give it huge amount of documents, and it would create some huge vectors, and it would just count how many times each word appears. It's a very simple account vectorizes that is using the bag of words model. Now, let's say we want to do something more interesting. The point of transforming words would be that we actually do some sort of machine learning algorithm on them. But the problem is, some documents could, could be very long and some very short, and that would confuse the machine learning algorithm that would be coming downstream. So a very good um, approximation would be, OK, not just count the words, but divide by how long the document is. Right? It's very simple. So the exact same uh, pattern, we will be using a transformer that will take the results from the count vectorizer, and they will just be scaled by how long the document was. Right? This is how we fit a transformer and how we actually transform. You will see that um, scikit-learn is very simple in the sense that some uh, models or transformers uh, work in two steps. The first step is some, some, sometimes called a, a fitting step, a training step, and the second step is actually applying what it has learned in the first step. Right? So if we now look at the same results, they are very similar to the ones up here, but you can see they have been scaled, right? Another interesting um, addition that we might consider, besides just counting the words and dividing by the length of the document, is called an inverse document. Um, the idea behind this is simple. Suppose that um, in Romanian you have the word A, and you say uh, 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 a lot of times. What could happen, the model that we were trying to train could consider A very important because it is appearing a lot of times. But inverse document transform tells us something differently. It tells us if the word A appears so, much, so many times in so many documents, it is actually irrelevant. It is the same with the word the in English, right? So what we are saying now, divide by how many times that word appears in many documents. And it will give us a better approximation about the importance of that word. The difference between this line of code and this one is that use inverse document frequency is called with true here. So again, we fit it and we transform it and we will see the results. They are similar. However, ana and are are now more important. And uh, mer is less important because it has appeared in two sentences, right? So look at how important it was here, and now it is less important, 
Let's remember our two sentences, right? So mer appears in both documents, but now because we have divided with the document frequency, mer is less important. Okay, now as you have seen here, we use the count vectorizer and uh, one or two transformers. We can also do this in one step. And in uh, scikit-learn, it's called the TF-IDF vectorizer. So term frequency, inverse document frequency vectorizer. And all, um, all the um, functions in uh, scikit-learn usually come with predefined good defaults, but you can uh, change their parameters easily. So around now, right now, I told, I told um, scikit-learn to use a mean uh, document frequency of zero and the max frequency of three. Um, when I return, so this uh, object, let's call it an object, the TF-IDF vectorizer, has these many parameters. Um, for now, let's just look at a couple of them. It has a token pattern. So what these uh, vectorizers do, usually they look at the text and they try to break it up in pieces. Uh, Scikit-learn is really bad at this, so they only do it with uh, uh, regular expression, so it's looking for white spaces, right? It is a very simple tokenizer. If you want to use something more, uh, more production-ready, I, re I recommend you look at Spacey. It is a very good uh, tokenizer. But for now, we will just use what we have because it is really easy. Okay, so um, anything else that is important? We also have the inverse document frequency set to true. And if we run it, again, um, I don't know if I've, I've told you, um, in uh, notebooks, you can run code in any order, right? Um, so it would be a good uh, thing to write your code in order and run it in order. Okay, and now if we look at the matrix, this is the final um, uh, transformation that this, vectorizer, that this vectorizer is giving us. So the shape of the result are the two sentences uh, times five. What does five represent here? T five is the size of our uh, vocabulary, right? And if we look at the actual vocabulary, we have the words that appear. One more thing that would be very interesting for me to tell you right now are something called n-grams. Have you heard about n-grams? Come on, n-grams. Okay, so, so, so. Okay, what are n-grams? n-grams are telling you this. Um, instead of just looking at words individually, look at groups of words, right? Maybe you have an expression that appears, right? Uh, languages uh, have expressions, so whenever a, an expression would appear, you have a chance of looking at that expression and treating it as a single token. And this is powerful. So what I have told it here, please use the same vectorizer, but right now for the um, uh, n-gram parameter, use one or two n-grams. And let's look at what it does. So remember the shape we have generated before? It was a two by five matrix. Now it is a two by 10. Whoa, so that means our dictionary increased from five to 10. How come? Who can help me with this? Guy in red, because he learned about n-grams. Why, why has our dictionary grown? Exactly, right? So be before we just had uh, individual tokens, ana, are, mer, and now we also have the groups of tokens, ana, are, are, mer, mer, shi, shi, mer, per, shi, per, right? We have just generated more features that we can use. Some of these, if they appear in many documents, we would discover them as being expressions for that particular language. Okay. So a quick summary for this uh, first lesson is that machines like to use numbers, and this is why we cannot just use text. We cannot just use uh, strings of characters. We need to take the strings of characters and transform them into numbers. And those, that transformation is how you get these features, right? So we have this transform a uh, collection of uh, words into a vector.
And we will be using this vector in the following uh, parts to see what we can do with them. Um, these are not the only vectorizers, uh, but they are very simple for me to explain, and they're very good starting points. So you'll see that even with simple uh, vectorizers th like this, you will walk a long way. Okay, let's go to the next lesson. This is a, um, a, a nice um, a proposition. I, I read it as, uh, as, uh, as um, like poetry. A computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of task T and performance measure P if its performance as task T as measured by P improves experience E. It was one of the first definitions of what machine learning actually does. It was by Tom Mitchell, I believe. Um, the idea is this, um, given enough examples to a machine learning algorithm, the machine algorithm should be getting better, right? This is why it's called machine learning, so the machine should be able to learn. But uh, he, he put it like in this kind of poetry. So, first of all, we need to load the data. And for this, I propose to you a package called Pandas. Uh, Pandas, you can think about it as uh, Excel, right? So, like you use Excel to show tables and move tables and select and everything. It's like an Excel for programmers, right? So, what we do right here, we're, we have something called a data frame. And when I will uh, read an Excel or a comma separated value file, it will load this into uh, this data frame. And I'll show you in a second how the data frame looks like. Okay. And now look, let's look at the data. So, as I said, it looks like an Excel. It has two columns. One column is called content. This is how I named it. And another column is called target. If you open the files, right? It's an actual, it's a pretty big file, 22 megabytes, yeah. right? So this is content and this is target, right? And if you look at it, these are all emails from a news group, and these are all the um, targets that we want to learn. So what, what is this 20 news group uh, data set? Uh, it's, uh, it's like a forum or, or where people were talking like 20 years ago about uh, electronics, computer graphics, uh, atheism, space, uh, hardware, and politics. And what we want to do is, looking at the, a piece of text from a discussion, can we actually infer the, what the discussion was about? Was it about politics, was it about science, or about hardware, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at all these examples, and we're going to train a model that can uh, predict uh, the label, right? Um, the target is also called a label, so if you, if you hear me um, switching between target and label and class, they all mean the same thing. Um, and this is usually called the input or features, right? So, if you want to take the first 10 items, we say data frame head of 10. If we look at the shape, uh, it's uh, 11,000 rows by two columns. We can see the names of the columns, their content and target. If you want to get the, the, the row number 10 with the, this, right? If we want to look at the content of the data frame, so remember we have the content uh, column and the target, we would say data frame content at location 10, and we can actually print the content. And this is a message saying that I have a line on Ducati, runs very well, so it's something about, let's, wait, let's see what, what the, the label for this was, so target. It was motorcycles, right? So this was a discussion about motorcycles, which is correct. Um, we can select ranges, so if we want to select uh, the rows between 100 and 110, this is how we do it. So it's, it is very flexible and very intuitive once you get to know it to work with pandas. You can move huge amount of, of data and uh, slice and dice and use it however you want. So really cool framework. Uh, let's see, I want to 
I want to know how many labels are in the labels column, so I can do value count. And this is showing me, okay, so we have about 600 uh, snippets of text about hockey and uh, 584 about graphics. So what you can see here, and this is something that if we have time we can discuss, um, we have an equal amount of um, uh, labels for each uh, row, which is very good. Well, ex except this one. So religion has uh, 377. But most of them are in the 500 to 600 range. And this is important because, wait for it, I'll tell you later. Uh, if we want to look, for example, of how the length of the messages themselves are distributed, you can just do a histogram, right, of the length. So most of the messages, so about 10,000 of them, are between uh, 0 and uh, 5,000 uh, characters long. And there are a couple that look are 30,000 characters long and some that are f over 5,000 characters long. Okay, and if we want to just shuffle all the rows, right? So we're not shuffling them independently, we're shuffling rows, right? So keeping the content and the target connected, right? We can just say resample the data set. Now, we will be using the vectorizer that I showed you earlier, and we would do a fit transform of the entire content. A fit transform is just basically the fit step followed by the transform step. But you can do it more efficiently like this. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it takes about 10 seconds for one CPU core to go through all the 11,000 rows and vectorize them. Re remember to transform them into those floating points. And it is done. Now, if we look at the shape, it has taken more than the, uh, more time because now we have a vocabulary of 100,000 tokens, right? So we have, imagine a matrix of 11,000 rows that were all the initial uh, uh, discussions. And now each discussion was actually split, or not split, transformed into a uh, vector of a thousand, a hundred thousand dimensions, right? So it, it, its length is a hundred thousand. If we look at the vocabulary, these are all the, the um, individual tokens that it, it has discovered in all the text. And you can see it, it also has engrams, right? So from is so common and Jack is so common that it has discovered this, uh, this engram which might be a good thing or a bad thing in this case. And we'll discuss why uh, not cleaning your text is a bad thing. Now, let's go to the actual machine learning part. Um, it, we are going to train a simple model. It's called Naive Bayes, and it's simple because it's naive or something like that. Um, we just do classifier equals multinomial Naive Bayes. If we look at it, it has some default values, so an alpha, a priority, and feed prior. And again, remember what I told you? Simple two-step process. You just say classifier fit, and it took one second to go through all 10,000 um, examples. And let's, uh, let's pick an example and see whether it can predict OK what is in there or not, right? So again, let me train it again. Oof. It just trained. So let's pick a sample. Let's say number one, two, three, four. And we will get the expected target. So this is the correct uh, category that it was uh, initially there. So it is uh, electronics. And now um, we're going to get the content, content to confirm that is about electronics. So it says article, something about HP. Manual, got into cosine effect, uh, father of a friend, police officer. So it could be, so a radar detector. So it could be a, about electronics. I'm not going to read it. Um, but what we need to do now is we need to feed it to the model that we have. 
But we, remember, we cannot feed the text directly. We already have that vectorizer that we, we fitted earlier, right? So if we look at this line, right? We fitted a, trans, uh, uh, a vectorizer that knows. So this is very tied to our problem. It only knows how to transform the text from something that it, it itself decided how to encode, right? So we're going to use it. And we're going to get the features. It doesn't show a big matrix. It says a sparse matrix. And because it's 100,000 lines, uh, I, I'd better not show it here. And now all we need to do is called classifier.predict and give it the features that we have extracted from the text. So let's see. OK, so it has predicted it's about an electronics. Let's go back. What was the target? The target was electronics. So is it correct? Well, we need to see if the expected target matches the predicted target. right? So it says true. So it seems to be doing something, right? Let's, let's try another example. So give me a number. Say a number. 88. 88. So 88 is about the religion Christian. And let's look at the content. So it's about uh, uh, liar, liar. I don't know. It says about Lord and OK. And it has predicted, again, religion Christian, right? So the model definitely knows something. So the, the question we have now, is it like, is it guessing or is it actually working? So let's predict all of the training set we have, right? So uh, re remember, in um, Pandas, you can work with rows, with lists, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't work with just one individual items. You can give it a full list, and it will compute that result for the full, full list. So give it a couple of seconds, because remember, we have this uh, transform. So what we did was we took the content, we transform it, and then we predict it. And we have something called Y predict. Let's take the first 10 results. So these are how the, our first 10 predictions. And let's look at our first 10 um, targets that were uh, the ground truth, the original. So they seem to be about graphics. The second one is about the religion. It, it predicted religion, but it looks like it's about uh, politics. The third one is about space. OK, this is correct. Again, uh, politics, politics, space, space. So it definitely did a mistake here. So we can just um, see how many of the 10 first results were correct. Right, right? So it says true, false, false, true, false, true, 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 true. We can just sum them up. So in Pandas, uh, the true value uh, defaults to 1. Right? So we get uh, 9. Right? And let's do for this for the entire data set. Right? right here, I just said just the first 10 results, but let's just do it for all of them. It takes a fraction of a second. Right? So this is how many it got right. This is how many there are. So there are 11,000 examples, and it got right about 10,000. And if we compute this, it says that it has an accuracy of 94%. And we would be wrong. Who, who knows why? Because you used the training data to predict. Exactly. So this is like a cardinal sin in, in, uh, in machine learning. Never train and predict and on the same data. Can, can you explain us why in a couple of sentences? Um, because uh, you're, you're basically, it's like if I'm asking you some questions, but I'm giving you the answers. Yeah. So the model can just memorize input and the correct labels, and then when I, because it has seen that data before, it can just, it's like a lookup table. Yeah, exactly. So um, what he said is this, if I am firstly giving you the answers, and then I'm quizzing you on the exact same answers, then I do not know if you actually understood what you're saying, or if you just noted them down, and then you're just giving them back to me, right? So it's about memorizing. And we do not want a model that memorizes. We want a model that generalizes. So how should we not have this mistake? What should we do? Some, someone in the room. What should we do? Say again? 
Folding, something, something simpler. Don't use fold yet. Okay. Split. Like Split. OK. So the, the idea is you take all your data. Some of it, you, you do training on it. And some of, of it, you do testing on it. Right? And this way, you are guaranteed, well, someone, uh, you should make sure that there is no training data in your testing data. And then when you evaluate your model, you only evaluate it on the testing data. And then you know if your model actually generalizes and has the accuracy that you're saying it has. So this is called a train test split. Um, Scikit offers something very similar. I would start to name, um, so inputs are usually called an X. Uh, uh, it's called a, a big X because it's usually a matrix. And the outputs um, Y. Uh, it's small because it's just a scalar output for each row. So X is a matrix, uh, Y is a vector. Um, and this is like normal way people call them. And what you do is you call train test split on X, Y. You say how big your test size want to be. I'm going to take 20%. You can do 30%. You can do 50%. It's up to you or the problem. And you can also give it like a random number so that it guarantees that you always get the exact same split. If you want to reproduce the the uh, results later, it is good that you do not have random stuff, just pseudo-random that you can control. So this is going to generate a train uh, input, a test input, a train output, and a test output. Let's look at how big they are. So it's 9,000 by 2,000. Remember, it's a 20% test size, right? And again, for the train and... Uh, uh, test of the output. Let's look uh, again at the same problem, but now applying what we have learned about the train test split. So we have the vectorizer, the classifier. We would fit the vectorizer, and then we would fit the classifier. And then we predict, and then we compare the results. And let's wait for it. OK. So this is how many results are correct, 1,900 out of 2,200, right? So the correct result, the accuracy of our model, it's not, what, what is it, 95%, nine, something like that? It's actually close to 84%, right? So it, it's, it's not memorizing, so using this model is not memorizing, but now we know for sure that this is kind of like the accuracy of combining this vectorizer with this model. Right? So let's do a quick summary. Uh, Pandas offers um, data structures and operation for manipulating tables and time series. It is very good for time series, trust me on this one. Uh, Pandas allows you to slice and dice the data. All operations uh, that are made on arrays, right? You, can, you start to think about tabular data, not individual rows, right? So all methods work on arrays. Um, working with classifier is like an easy two-step process. And we need to evaluate how good our training train model is. So never, never, ever in your life train and test on the same data. And when we get to the deep learning part, we'll see why we need train validation and test data. So we'll be covering that soon. Questions before I move on, please. Question, questions, come on. Sure, let's do it. So let's do something more extreme, right? So for test size, we'd say 80%. So <laughs> why? Let, let, let's do it. Like, yeah. So now our train size is this, and our test size is really big. So care to make predictions? Higher, smaller? Yeah, we'll drop. 40, I'm hearing 40, so it's 68. So you're right, it dropped. Why did it drop? That's a good question. Why did it drop? Someone answer me. Yes, so it didn't have enough examples to actually learn anything useful, right? Okay, any more questions? Yes. How can we increase the accuracy? Right, we'll cover that in the next, uh, uh, next lesson. Yeah. 
any, anything like something that it doesn't feel right about this? I don't know. Say again, so. Ah, why, why didn't we get 100% accuracy? Yeah, it, it is because the way this uh, naive base work, right? So it's not actually that smart even to memorize stuff, right? <laughs> Which is a good thing, right? Um, some models are made uh, from mathematical concerns and some are made from um, actual physical constraints. And actually memorizing terabytes of data and then actually searching inside terabytes of data is bad. So, yes, overfitting. Can someone tell us what overfitting is? Tell us. <laughs> That's a good one. So. What, well, how would you define overfitting? So let, let, me, let me do this. So if I were to draw a line that goes through these points, one line, right? And let me draw another one. And let's say on this axis, this is price. And this, what do I want this to be? Um, mm, popularity? OK, popularity of what? OK, so is so. Let's say it's like phones right here, right? Popularity of phones, and this is the price of phones. So I've drawn two lines, one that accurately fits the data, and one that, it, you know, it just says, I don't go there. It's just like a very simple interpretation, right? So which one would you actually trust, the red one or the green one, to, to, to do a prediction? So I, I'm going to ask you is, like, make a prediction for... Um, what would be the price for this item? So right here we have an item with this popularity. What would be the price you would ask for it in a store? Would it be this price? Or it would be this price? The upper one? Could you like explain why? Okay, so you're using something called a trend. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, okay. So you're all all uh, saying this intuition that this is somehow wrong, even though it's good, right? So I came up with a line that goes through all the points, but you're gonna, not going to trust it. You're not going to use it. Because somehow it doesn't feel that it could generalize well, right? It's like the green line, which is very simple, generalize is good. And this is what we call overfitting. So you have so much uh, ab abstraction power and so much learning power that you start to see patterns when, where there are not, right? You just have too few data, and this is just noise, and you actually learn the noise which is bad, right? We don't want models like this. Yes? Actually, what we mean is to train your model on noisy data, on noise, not to yeah. agree on the truth. Yes. True. OK, going further. So, so far we, we know how to do like uh, vectorization, and now we know how to train a simple model. Let's do something called Pipeline. Why do we need a pipeline? 
So remember how many steps we did there? So we had like vectorization and then training and splitting and then uh, training a model. Um, and then when you get to predict the data, again, you have to remember that you have to use the same vectorizer that you do when training the data, right? So it becomes cumbersome and you can make mistakes. So what the creators of Scikit did said, hey, if you have these many transformations, why don't you put them together into something we like to call a pipeline and just say this is one transformation, right? Easy. So let's do this. Again, we're going to read the data frame. We're going to use um, X and Y. Let's do this like this, separate steps. OK. And now, remember, I used to have something called a classifier, which is the multinomial naive base. But now, I just put in the count vectorizer before it. Right? It's what we've always been doing. It's like calling a vectorizer and then calling the naive base. But now, what I'm saying is just put them one after another, and consider this a classifier. So, right? so we're abstracting some of the repetitive stuff. Um, again, we're doing a train a test split. We're fitting the classifier, and we're predicting. And then we're going to measure the uh, accuracy. OK, so this, this is simpler, right? This is simpler compared to... Um, Right? You, you do have to do stuff like this and remember, and you have to have an extra variable. Um, now, let's look at something called a classification report. So this is a function that takes into values the, um, the true. So these are the true values of the labels of the categories. And these are our predicted ones. So the classification report gives us, for each of the labels, it gives us the precision, the recall, an F1 score, and how many items of that item it did when it calculated the precision and recall. Um, this shows us that it is doing better for some, some labels, so it can really know when something is about atheism or not, uh, better than, let's say, uh, better than when it's about Windows, right? Who knows? Maybe it likes atheism more than Windows. So precision is also called. Um, okay, so precision is the fraction of relevant instances from the retrieved instances, and recall is the fraction of relevant instances that have been retrieved from Virtual. Let me show you uh, a picture of how this all looks like. Wikipedia has a nice page on it. So precision is this green part over this entire circle. And recall is this green part over the entire rectangle. So uh, yeah, it, it, it's mind-bungling, right? Even me from time to time, I have to go back. And, but the example is simple. So suppose you have a computer program that recognizes dogs in photographs and identifies eight dogs from 12 dogs. So you had like uh, pictures and you had uh, 12 dogs and you only recognizes eight of them. Uh, out of the eight that it says that they are dogs, five are dogs and the rest are cats. So five over eight, right? So the dogs that it actually recognizes as dogs and it was sure is called the precision. Precision. So five out of eight or is the precision, and recall is 5 out of the 12. So it only detected 5 dogs out of the 12 dogs that were in the data set. And um, sometimes you want a model that has high precision, sometimes you want a model that has high uh, recall, and sometimes you don't know what you want, so you want a mix of both, the precision and recall, and that is called the F1 score. So it's kind of like an average between precision and recall. Um, you ask how can we make the model better, right? So we, what we can do is start playing with the vectorizer and with the actual model. Maybe change the model entirely, or change the parameters of the vectorizer, or change the parameters of the model. And we will do that right now. Because now we have a pipeline, and we can easily see which model is good and which is bad. So 
the one we have right now with the count vectorized and, and the multinomial. It has uh, just it has 84. Let's switch in the count vectorizer with a TF-IDF vectorizer, see if this improves stuff. No, pretty bad. Okay, let's change the parameters of the TF-IDF vectorizer and keep the same model. What it's saying here is also use n-grams, right? Remember the n-grams? So now we have 84, and when using n-grams, now we have 86, so 2% improvement just by changing one parameter, right? And classification um, is a very known problem. It's uh, supervised uh, learning. So machine learning uh, is made up of supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. It's called supervised because um, the algorithms have like a teacher, a supervisor, that is giving them both the question and the correct answer. Right? This is supervised. Uh, unsupervised, the teacher is just giving you a lot of stuff and say, find a way to organize them. I don't know how, but find a way to organize them. So find me patterns. And reinforcement learning says, um, drive the car around town, and when you get to the destination, I'll give you the amount of money I consider you, you are worth. And I'm not telling you why I'm giving you that amount of money, but over time you should learn that um, if you're crashing the car, if you're braking too fast, if you're screaming at people, uh, I'm going to penalize you. But you don't know that until the end. So a, lot, a sequence of uh, actions, and you get the reward of the end. This is reinforcement learning. And it is very powerful because it uh, is very close to how our world behaves. Do not get immediate feedback right now, right? In supervised learning, it's very simple. You do something or you know something and you get the label or the target immediately. So what we do have here is a collection. For, so for example, multinomial, Gaussian, a linear a support vector classifier, stochastic gradient descent classifier, k nearest neighbors. So k nearest neighbors is one of the classifiers that actually stores all the results, right? So what it does is, so who knows how k nearest neighbor classifier works and likes to tell us? OK, come on, it's k near neighbor. So what it does, it stores all the points that I'm giving it, right? So imagine um, I have circles here, and I have squares here. OK. Um, you wanted to say something? No? OK, so um, k nearest neighbors, uh, would work like this. So suppose I'm giving you a new point here. What would you say it is? A circle or a green square? Circle, right? How would you do that? You said, OK, like the nearest stuff to me are circles, right? So this should be a circle. OK, if I give you this, you're going to say square, OK, right? So this is how k nearest neighbors classifiers work. Do you know how support vector machine works? Yep. Yes? Can you sh sh say that? Draws a so. Uh, yeah? Uh, yeah? It, it, it's looking to place the line. So yes? It's at the greatest distance from any. Right, right. Okay, so what he said, like a support vector machine uh, draws a line, right? You could draw a line here, a line here, a line here, right? But which would be the, like, the best line to draw? The line that? Where it's furthest away from any point. So the line that is furthest away from any point, right? So these points are called the supports of this line. This is why they're called support vector machines, because they draw a line, but not any line. You could draw like this line, or you can draw like this line, right? But they say this is the best line, because when you have new points coming in, and you're going to use this line, right? You're going to make a mistake. But if you use this line, you're going to be OK. Right? So this is how support vector machines work. And all of the machine learning algorithms have some tips and tricks. So, for example, a, a, tree, a tree classifier, right? A random decision forest or a jungle or a whatever gradient boosted decision trees you're going to use. Um, what they do is they draw areas, right? So they're going to say, OK, let's, uh, let's split it like this, and then split it like this, 
and then split it like this, and then split like this, and now anything that falls in this area is red, anything that falls in this area is red, anything that falls in this area is green, right? And you have like this um, way to shape up your um, surface, your space, right? And uh, it's a good way because uh, in a tree, you could ask the tree, hey, why did you make uh, the decision to make this point green? And he would say, well, you know, uh, I, made, I, I draw a line here, and then anything that was bigger than this line, I, I said is uh, green, and anything that is bigger than this line is green, and you can get an answer. Whereas if you ask a support vector machine, why do you think this is green? It's kind of hard for it to tell you like the equation of the line, because it's a line in 2D space. But we are working with uh, 100,000 dimensional space, so that, that surface is very hard for you to understand why it draw like this and said, right? So let's go further. So we have all these kind of classifiers, and uh, the reason I put them here is for you to just copy them and experiment with them. So let me show you how I'm gonna, gonna, how I'm gonna go about it. So I'm gonna put a random forest classifier here. I just copied from here and replaced the um, multinomial, right? So this is what I did, right? Yeah, th th this is what the data scientists do. They copy paste stuff. Okay. And is, let's also run something with a stochastic gradient descent and something with a k nearest classifier and wait for them to finish. So the random forest classifier with, without any parameters is worse than our 85%, was it? 80, 86%, right? Um, the uh, stochastic gradient descent classifier, on the other hand, is like 92%, which is way good. And again, k nearest neighbors classifier with no uh, parameters is like 75%. And let's see. So another trick why you should use uh, the notebook is you can shift tab inside the parameter, right? Shift tab. And it is going to give me suggestions of, of what I can put in there. And I can see it's like, uh, nearest neighbors is five, right? So I would just go here, put nearest neighbors equals 10. Why not? We're experimenting. So, worse. <laughs> okay. So, now I have another question for you. How do we know that the, re the results we, we were getting are relevant? How do we know that we weren't just lucky or unlucky? How do we know that? We don't? Could we know? How? Okay. So she's telling us that in order for us to be, sh not 100% sure, but surer the, uh, that our um, uh, results are uh, okay, is we run the same experiment, but we modify the training and the testing. And this is called cross-validation, or k-fold cross-validation. You, you know about it, right? Can you explain how k-fold cross-validation works? Okay, so this is my data set. You use part one to four okay. for training, and then part five for testing. Okay, so this is for training, this is for training, this is for training, and this is for testing, right? Yeah. And we get a result here. Result. Let's say it goes 8 to 5%, and then? You take one, two, and four for training, and use three for testing. One, two, and four. And we get, um, I don't know, 80%. And, then you, can and you can just keep it. Okay. Okay, and this is, let's say, 83, right, when we, when we get to testing. Right. So this is how k-fold works. Right, so using your same data, what you're doing is you're training a model here, you're getting the result, you're training another model here, you're getting the result, you're training another model here, you're getting the result, right? So again, 
we're not combining training and testing, we're just training a new model on different sets of the same data, right? And we can see now that our model is somewhere between 80% and 85%. If someone got this and said, this is 85, he was just lucky. Or if he says, like, this is 80, he was just unlucky, right? And in practice, it varies quite a lot. Um, the cross-validation code is a bit uh, ugly. Nothing I can do about it. Ah, that's a good question. So big variation usually means uh, you do not have enough data. This is what usually happens when you have few data. There is huge validation. It happens what happened when we did the 80-20 split and then the 20-80 split. You were missing critical pieces of information and your accuracy dropped. Right? So what people are doing, uh, an extreme case of k-fold is called... Um, leave one out, right? So what it, this does is just selects one single element for uh, uh, testing and trains on all of this. And again, it selects just one element for, and it trains on all of this, right? So this is an extreme case called leave one out, and it happens, you should do this one when you have uh, very little data. Because when you do the k-fold to the extreme, let's say we do a k-fold of 100, you're going to end up with this case. And when you do a k-fold of 100, you're not going to see this variation. Right? This is one. What's going Yes? So you want to automate? Uh, uh, the parameters that we are trying in order to get the model? Done oh, by, by hand? Uh, yes, I'm going to say how you do it, but I'm not going to show you now because it takes a while. So it's called a grid search, right? So what the grid search does is... Let's say this is uh, n grams equals to 1, and this is n grams equals to 2. Uh, no. And this could be um, using a count vectorizer, and this could be using a TF vectorizer. Right? So uh, what the grid search would do, it would look in all sorts of possible combinations, and it would give you the best result. It's, uh, it is something called uh, nowadays AutoML, and there are frameworks uh, online that are searching the hyperparameters for you. Okay, uh, an example of how a big and complex pipeline would look like. So this, uh, this pipeline also looks at an email and does a union, so a combination of multiple features. And uh, the first one is extracting the subject of the email. Um, and doing a TFIDF on the subject alone. Uh, another one is extracting the body, doing a TFIDF, and then doing a truncated um, decompositional matrix. Doesn't matter, it's just generating some features. And another one is looking at the body and creating a dictionary vectorizer, similar to the count and TFIDF vectorizer. And the uh, union just puts all of these features next to each other, right? So we all are already using 100,000 uh, dimensional vectors. This is just saying, OK, you can add more vectors and treat it as a bigger vector, right? So this is how pipelines can look like, right? And if you were to do this by hand, you'd also had to uh, call all the vectorizers when you would uh, put in new data. So for training, it would be OK. But for testing, you'd have to duplicate all the code. So this is why pipelines are a good thing. A uh, quick summary, we tried multiple classifiers, multiple features. We showed a bit how reporting looks like, an accuracy, and an F1 score. Questions, please.
You could do that, yeah? Yeah? Is that the idea? Yeah, so the idea, the, the idea is, is this. So if you transform data into data, it's called a transformer. And if you take data and transform it into a model, it's called an estimator. And all of the classifiers I showed you pro previously are uh, estimators. And all of the vectorizers I showed you earlier, they're transforms. What you could do is you could put in transformer, 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 estimator, and all of this is equal to an estimator, right? And, or you could put transformer, 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 and all of this is equal to a transformer, right? What, what they're doing here, they're actually generating, so at one of the transformers, uh, the one that was here, they're actually uh, generating features in an interesting way. They're this, right? So it's saying this transformer actually generates a lot of uh, features, probably more than 100,000, like we are, probably 1 million. But then it's saying, hey, I don't want all the features. Just select the top 50 features that you think are interesting, right? So this is an interesting transformer, the truncated, SVD transformer, and it's just selecting some features, right? So it is a transformer, after all, because it's, it's taking a lot of features and transforming into a small subset of features, but it's not an estimator, it's still a transformer, right? And with the pipelines, you could just put a lot of uh, transformers. So what they did in the pipeline, uh, they created a transformer that is a union, so let's put uh, concatenation with plus. So they had like transformer, transformer, plus, transformer, 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 plus, transformer, transformer, right? So this is what they did inside the pipeline. And somewhere here, they put an estimator. Yeah. Okay. And also, with transformers, you can actually add weights to them, right? You can say this transformer is more important than the other. And at the end, they just use a support vector machine classifier with a linear kernel. If you're not going to ask questions, I'm going to ask questions. Um, OK, let me ask something different. So suppose you have um, two classes. So. People that, I don't know, something not morbid. Uh, people that have an extra, um, I don't know, an extra finger. Okay, people that have an extra finger, right? But, but it should be something that is not easily seen on the outside. Let's think of something else. A what? An extra kidney. Okay, so let's say people that have an extra kidney, right? And this is life-threatening. Like threatening. And one in a thousand have an extra kidney. Um, and we train a model that is looking, I don't know, at the skin color, at the, the amount of uh, nipples they have, and all sorts of features that you can come up with, right? And at the end, they predict that it has an extra kidney or it doesn't have an extra kidney. But remember, for every 1,000 normal people, you have one with an extra kidney. So you come up with your classifier, and I come up with my classifier, and my classifier just predicts that no one has an extra kidney. How, what happens then if someone tries to measure the precision of our algorithms? I'm just going to be wrong 0.1% of the time, right? So what happens is, this is called class imbalance, right? So for every 1,000, you have one of a different class. Okay. Say again? Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a wrong scale, right? It's like, it is so easy for the algorithms to see patterns. They're trying really hard, right? You're going to give them, suppose you give them 2,000 examples, and two of them will have uh, an extra kidney, right? It's going to look so hard for patterns inside the features for those two people, right? And it's going to overfit. That's the problem. 
So what would be the solution when, when you have this big imbalance? Exactly. So, so you, you need to balance them somehow. So what you could do, you can upsample the class that has uh, too few examples. It's kind of hard in this because you need to create artificial data, right? Yeah. There are algorithms that can do that. Or you could downsample the class that has so many normal people, right? You can only take two normal people from the 2,000 and the two that have an extra kidney, and now you have only have four examples. Or you can do something in between. Downsample the extra large, upsample the extra low class. Um, this is something that happens a lot in practice, sadly. So what happens is you have class imbalance, and you need to upsample, downsample. Yes? Exactly. For example, for photos, you would do random, maybe something like rotate crop or uh, change the contrast and things like that to generate more yes. examples in a specific way. Yes. So what he's saying is to make your algorithm more robust, you could uh, augment your data by adding some noise while still keeping the same label, right? So you have pictures of, uh, I don't know, leopards, uh, right? And you only have one in a thousand uh, pictures of leopards. You could start to scale, zoom in, zoom out, uh, rotate the image, and you could generate more images of leopards, right? But for our extra kidney example, it's kind of like hard, right? Yes? No, so the, these are uh, classical machine learning models. Uh, they usually have the stop conditions inside them. Uh, you don't have to worry. So they're pretty robust with the default parameters. But if you know where to look and what to modify, you could um, make them work harder or longer to give you the exact result. Yeah, you could force it. Some of the models, yeah, you can force them to iterate more and more, right? Yeah. Um, OK. Questions? So what I did here, um, so we used the test classification to see if the article was about religion and politics and so forth, which is very interesting. And I told you about this use case uh, in the first slides, but I also said like sentiment analysis, right? People are interested if, if some customers leaves a review, a bad review, a good review. And I'm going to show you uh, how text classification can be used for sentiment analysis. It's like not the best uh, match between the two worlds, but it is something you can do now. I, you know how you can do it at home in five lines of code, so let's do it. So I have some... Um, I think they were Twitter, because it says something like, can't update is fine. I dive so many times. My f whole body feels itchy. So yeah, this feels like Twitter. Uh, you need to extract this. OK, so this is pretty big, 200 megabytes. Don't double click. So we don't have any column data. So I'm just going to take the last column, the one that has the content, and the first column that has the emotion. Um, so I'm just going to name them content and target, because we're used to that. And now you can have the content on the left and the target on the right, because I ordered them to be that way. And let's look at the value counts. So there are like 800,000 tweets that are positive, so 4 means positive and 0 means negative, right? And there are 8,000 negative ones. So remember to shuffle the, your data set. Why? Because it could be that all the uh, uh, positives are first and all the negatives are second, and when you train your algorithm, it's not going to learn anything. So do make a habit of shuffling your data, right? Um, some, some algorithms do that for you, so... And 
remember that we can slice and dice. I'm just going to take 100,000 rows. I, I don't want to work with uh, 1,600,000 rows. Right? And now let's do actu the actual sentiment analysis part. Right? So again, we're going to take the inputs and the outputs. We're going to create a simple pipeline. This time I'm going to use a linear support vector machine. I'm going to train test split. And I'm going to go print the classification report. Right? Ta -da. Right? So very, very easy. It has like almost 80% accuracy. And we did no text preprocessing. We just used simple algorithms, a simple pipeline. I don't know how many lines of code, but do you guys understand this? I mean, is it simple? Would you use it? This is a good question. How many of you would go home and try uh, an experiment involving text classification after this workshop? Couple, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so some of you would. Why wouldn't you? Come on, tell me. Why, why, why wouldn't you, for example? Yeah, why would you or why wouldn't you? You would? Would she? No? Why not? OK. Who wouldn't? Come on. I mean, uh, it, it's very easy to try and do an experiment like this. Uh, you, you would find that you can come up with very interesting use cases. So for example, um, we have a, a chatbot that is running in about 5, 000, 5 million end users right now. And it's not very complex compared to this. I mean, once you know the basics, um, you can build all sorts of interesting stuff, right? You can do sentiment analysis to see why people are leaving bad reviews or on a mug. Um, uh, you could uh, uh, do an experiment where you could analyze all your emails, right, to see what kind of patterns you are into, if you don't already know, um, right? So questions, questions, yes. So I would invest time in learning about all of this concept and mastering them and knowing that there, there is a easy, cheap alternative. So if I would spend one or two days coming up with features and I'm here and AutoML spends uh, three hours or five hours coming up with these features, I, and I am paid this amount of salary, and I pay right. It makes sense for me to use AutoML, um, but it depends. I mean, I wouldn't put a tool like AutoML in the hands of people who do not master the basics at least. But to answer your question, yeah, it, it depends on what you're trying to do. So when you've hit the limits on what your uh, data scientist can do, yes, I would run a tool like AutoML or AutoKeras. Yeah. Other questions? So, what is? How many examples they had? So, uh, I only took like 100,000 uh, examples, right? And test was 20%, uh, so 220,000. And they, they, they don't, yeah, they're a bit more, but it doesn't matter. So, for example, I used. Um, I had this project where I had to do a computer vision task, and um, there were very ma there were a lot of parameters that that they, they needed to be tweaked. Right, is like pixel level and filters and so all of that. And um, what I did was I created like um, um, a validation set. Right, so I would kn know what the correct answers would be. And I already know that my pipeline was okay-ish, but I did not know the parameters. So I just let the computers run overnight, well, for two nights, and they, come up with, they came up with the best combination of parameters, right? But I wouldn't even call this machine learning. This is just exploring dumb uh, uh, search space. Um, what AutoML and services like this are doing, they 
they tend to get smart because after a while you see that some parts of the area are not worth exploring and some parts are worth exploring. And there are ways you can optimize this process because it's something called the curse of dimensionality, right? Exploring combinations by combinations, when you multiply stuff, they grow out of hand very fast. Okay, so we have 15 more minutes. I would like to tell you about uh, word embeddings. Um, word to vec, paragraph to vec, and language models. Was this my order? <sighs> so, here is the problem. Um, we know that machines can't work with text. Right? We took the text and we transformed it into vectors. But the vectors we have are very sparse. Right? So a sentence, so imagine we have a document that is a sentence. A sentence has 10 words, but our vocabulary is 100,000 words. So that sentence is represented as a couple of zero point something, 10 items in a 100,000 words vector. And this is why it's called a sparse, right? Because most of the vector is just zeros, and um, just the 10 parts of it are uh, actual numbers. And this is kind of odd. Is couldn't there be like a shorter representation for that word or for that sentence? And it turns out there is. It is something called a dense vector or an embedding. And it is usually small, let's say 100 to 300 dimensions. So we were using 100,000 dimensions in our examples, but a word uh, embedding can be very small, 100 dimensions. And now you might ask me, how would you go about discovering these sorts of dimensions? Right? How would you go about creating these sort of vectors? Or why would you go about creating these sort of vectors? Well, the reason why is this. Um, suppose there is the entire literature of this entire world, and I can read all of it right, with my algorithm. But if I'm doing what I have been doing with machine learning, I wouldn't have learned anything. I'm just learning some very simple statistics, right? So all I'm generating is like huge vectors with simple statistics inside. I'm not really learning anything useful about the words themselves. So the difference between cow and fans is just, this has a one here, let's say it's a one hot encoding, there's one here, and fans is, has one here, right? So they're purely different uh, uh, vectors. But maybe, cow and fence, or maybe cow and milk, right? Cow and milk would be very different. But if we read text and we learn something about text, is that they are somehow related, right? So this is what um, word embeddings allow us to do. They can find smaller dimensions between vectors. Uh, let's look at an example. So if we have these four words, king, man, woman, and queen in a, a word-to-vec setting, which is the, the dense vectors that I've been telling you about, you can see correlations. So man is to woman like king is to, and the algorithm would be able to infer that it is queen, right? So somehow, when you force the algorithm, and there are a couple of algorithms, to use this um, very dense representations, they also learn all sorts of relationships between words. So for example, uh, it knows how to put a verb uh, in or remove the um, present from it. So walking can go to walk, and swimming can go to swim, right? So it knows how to do this because it has seen so many sentences, it has computed some, some, some sort of correlations between all the words. It, it's not super extraordinary, but it's better than the model we've had before. So what people are doing, they're saying, OK, so we have these vectors about a woman, a man, that we have learned by looking at a lot of text. What can we do with it? 
So what we can do with it is we can take an entire paragraph, right? the sentence we had, anare mere, and we can combine the uh, word uh, vectors into something we would like to call a paragraph vector. Right? Why would this be useful? Because imagine each word has kind of like a direction, saying something about it within itself, right? So if I were to say something about uh, uh, a man, I'm also saying something about a woman, right? And if I'm saying something about a woman, I'm also saying something about the man. So it has a direction inside of it saying something about the humanity, and probably there is a difference, um, something about the sexuality, right? All within those 100 dimensions. So what happens is we're going to take a, a sentence, we're going to create a vector from, from that uh, sentence. And from that vector, it's going to be a very small vector, and we already know what we can do with vectors. We can put them through a classifier, and we can classify text with it, if we wish. It turns out that paragraph to vec uh, it gives us slightly better results. So from the vectorizers that we previously used, using a word to vec vectorizer would give us better results. Right? And this was uh, valid like five years ago. And recently, people are saying, OK, we're using these vectors, but we're not combining them in a smart way. Um, let's think about how we would go about combining them in something uh, that, we can, that it can be more useful for us. So what they said is this. When you're just using words, you're forgetting about the context of the sentence so far that you have read. So they are starting to create um, representations, or something we call language models, that take into account the context of the sentence so far. So remember our bag of words model that took us this far? This model actually knows the order of the words is important, and it doesn't forget about it. It, it knows about it, and it, and it uses it. Um, think about the autocomplete, right? So when you use uh, your uh, autocomplete on your swipe Android phone, it is actually using something called a recurrent neural network. And it is using the context of previous characters to try to predict the next characters or the next words that you're trying to write. And if, you've been using, uh, uh, if you have been using uh, Gmail for the past week, they've rolled a new feature where when you're starting to type words, it actually generates complete sentences for you. It is what? Yeah, let's, uh, let me share. So. It doesn't work right now. See? So I wrote how, and it started to predict how are you. You might think that they wrote, wrote a bunch of rules to do that. No, they didn't. They're using recurrent neural networks at the character level, at, at the word level, to try to predict what the next words I should be writing about. And if I give how are you. It doesn't want to work. So it doesn't always work. Probably they, they don't have enough resources or not dedicating to fully rolling out this feature. But this is what I'm trying to do. So companies are creating these language models that are trying to predict the next word or the next couple of words. And they're doing this by taking account of the context of the words they've seen so far. And they do take account in the words they've seen so far by looking at these dense representations. So looking at the sparse representations was use, useless, but looking at these dense representations, which are called embeddings, is very useful. And there are three competing algorithms right now. 
the one that I recommend, and we, if we have five minutes, I would look over the, the code. It's by um, uh, Universal Language Model. Um, uh, they're, by, uh, they're done by uh, Jeremy Howard. Uh, he has some very interesting courses about deep learning called Fast AI. And this is a model he created. And the idea is this. In uh, computer vision, deep learning computer vision, you have layers of uh, deep neural networks, and you can use a pre-trained network, take parts of it, and that, then just change the end, train it for a bit, and poof, you have a new network. So let me show you how this works for images, because this is the kind of technology that was winning contest in 2012. So. <clears throat> This is an image, and these are layers of neural network, whatever. And this is a cat, right? And as you go deeper into this new deep neural network, they start to learn features. So the first layer usually learns something like this. So it knows how to detect uh, edges, lines, probably dots, right? Uh, the next layer learns how to combine these features, right? So it learns how to create, I don't know, combine two lines and make something like this, right? Or make something like this. Or combine two of these to make something like this, right? And at this layer, you could already detect, I don't know, ears, nose, and stuff like this. And at this layer, you would be able to detect the face of a cat, right? With ears, eyes, and nose. Right? So deep, deep neural networks, as they have more and more layers, they learn more and more abstract representations. And what people were doing, they are saying, OK, so actually the first layers actually are very similar to how the human uh, eye and uh, brain works. So our eyes and brains at the first layers, there are, are very high similarities. We, we see like basic shapes, diagonal lines and dots. And um, as we go further, we do not know if it's similar or not. But anyway, this is how deep neural networks learn. And what they said is like, OK, so I have trained this model on 10 million images. But I want to train a new model for, I don't know, something you want to detect. What do you want to detect? Cars. No, it already has cars. Let's say you want to detect, uh, tree. it already has trees. Let's say you want to detect Barbie dolls and Darth Vader's, right? So it already has 10 million images of cars and trees and images and whatever, right? But what you could do is like cut this network part, right? Use it here, add an extra layer at the end, put in the new images of Darth Vader and uh, Barbies, and train the last layer and keep this one frozen, right? And this is called transfer learning, because you're using a network that's been trained on 10 million images, and you can just put in like, a, let's say, 100 new images, 100 new images, and you now have a classifier that can detect Barbie dolls and Darth Vader's, which is something extraordinary, because 99.99% of the processing work has been done for you, and you just add an extra layer and just do a bit of work. And now you have a deep learning model that can detect and solve your problem. And, well, this is like a toy example, but you could solve, like, People are solving, detecting cancer cells, or I don't know what kind of diseases for the eye, or um, looking at um, radiology reports, or mammalian cancer, or all sorts of interesting uh, parts that they haven't been originally trained on. And they do not have 10 million images to train on. But because they know how to detect basic parts, they can learn just the complex parts. And the the thing that they're trying to do with um, natural language processing, which is something really new from one or two years ago, is that they want to apply the same concept. They want to do transfer learning, but this time for text. And they have a problem, because um, 
it's not as easy as it, is, as it is for images. So for the images, this works great. But for text, if you just use the word embeddings that I have showed you, right, it, the results are not impressive. But if you, but if you combine the, uh, the, the layers, the recurrent neural layers, if you know how to combine them, this is what we're trying to do. They're trying to create a, something called a language model. And they're trying to combine the previous knowledge they have, the context. So the context never leaves, right? The, the words come into the network, and they stay in the network. And this is how they maintain the context. And what they're trying to do is, OK, I've trained the language model on the entire Wikipedia. Right? This is Wikipedia text. And they just want to add something at the end, which is our classifier, and classify new pieces of text. OK. So you have three models. One is by um, Jeremy. It's called UML Fit. Uh, one, I think, is from Baidu, which uses bidirectional long-term, short-term memory cells. This one uses as well, but. Uh, and this is from OpenAI Transformer. I think the document is still a work in progress. Um, sadly, I cannot show you how this model works, because it takes like two hours to run. <laughs> uh, but I just want you to understand a general idea of how deep learning works and what they're trying to do. They're trying to use a pre-trained network and just add a classifier at the end. And what it has happened in practice is that they're breaking all the state-of-the-art algorithms by far. So they're probably reducing the error rate from 10%. So from what was our, so let's say it's 80% here. They, they can probably reduce the error rate by half. So they can easily get a 90% by using the bidirectional LSTMs language models that I am trying to show you. Yes. And let's have a look at how this looks like. So they're trying to do sentiment analysis on the uh, Internet Movie Database. I'm not going to run through the code. I'm just going to tell you like a high, high level. So they, they are loading the data. They have some special tokens. They're calling beginning of sentence and uh, beginning of field. So remember our tokenizer? They have a, a smarter tokenizer saying, hey, it's a sentence going to start, or this field is like uh, the title, this field is the body, this field is like the subject, whatever. Um, again, making sure they have the correct classes, nothing interesting here. This is how they like to shuffle data. So apparently, you can generate the permutation and apply the permutation. Um, OK. Again, they're using the simple train test split that uh, we have talked about. And by this time, they have all the training data that we have, so similar to what we have here. right? So they have this data or this data. Again, it is with 0 and 4. I believe they're the same. Uh, I don't know why they're the same. Um, so. What they're trying to do now, they're trying to manually clean the data. So we should have done this in the Twitter example as well. There are all sorts of ampersand, smiley faces, and at signs that are usually uh, annoying to the model. Um, they're creating those special fields for beginning of sentence and end of, uh, and beginning of field. And by this time, they have uh, transformed their entire um, data set into vectors. So by here, they already have, no, by already, they have all the tokens here. OK. They have a frequency counter, similar to what we used uh, in our counting example. Um, they're setting their maximum vocabulary to 60,000. Remember, we had 100,000. They're saying, we, 
we don't see any improvement over 60,000. And when you're using the GPU, every little bit counts. So they're saying, OK. And they're adding two more, um, two more tokens. This is padding, and this is unknown. So unknown uh, will default to, for, for example, uh, it is a word you haven't seen before, just something new to your dictionary. What would you do in that case? Well, in that case, you, what you usually do, you add in an embedding that is the average of all the embeddings that you already have. And uh, they're creating a dictionary of all the... Um, uh, so what they're doing is they're taking the words, but they're not creating a vector. They're just giving them an ID. So remember our vocabulary examples here? So it's saying that, OK, Anna should have ID 0, Are should have ID 2. This is what they're doing. Why? Why are they doing this? Because they already have a mapping for their pre-trained model, right? And they need to match the mappings between their own model, the pre-trained model, and the new mappings they're creating right now that are new, right? Um, OK, so they have a string to integer and integer to string. You, they have both transformation. So given are, they can have two, and for given two, they know it's are. And um, this is the uh, language model. Basically, the language model, look here, it is called, so M size is the embedding size, number of hidden is number of hidden layers, and uh, no, uh, NH is number of hidden layer activations, and uh, NL is the number of layers. So they're, what they're saying is we have three layers, and each layer is outputting about 1,000 activations to the next layer, right? And uh, we have about 400 units in uh, neurons in each layer. So something like this. Only they're outputting uh, 1,000 activations. OK, they're loading their pre-trained uh, model. You can download it here. It, it's a very big model, so it's um, like a 400 megabytes model, right? Pretty big. Um, they're loading it into memory. Now, they're doing some uh, magic with uh, hooking up the, um, uh, the weights of the model, because they need to cut it and uh, hook it up. And this is done here. And now comes the interesting part, right? So they're saying, hey, we're going to train this model, the, the end that we have put. We're going to train it a bit. Um, Backpropagation through time, what is this? Uh, Backpropagation through time is this. So you cannot put in the entire uh, document or the, all the documents inside your GPU, but you can take chunks of them. And this is how big a chunk is. So what they do is they have something called the backpropagation, and they wiggle it around. They make it smaller or bigger in order to fit new words and generate augmented data. Right? Um, they create these language models. Um, dropouts. OK, let's talk about dropout. So it turns out that when you have neural networks, what happens is when neurons are connected, so Um, they, they start to get correlated. So when they fire together, they're actually not that good because they're, they're sending redundant signals, right? So what dropout is, is like one of the biggest inventions, 2013, 2014. From time to time, you just say, this neuron is not allowed to fire, and this neuron is not allowed to fire. And what it does is forces them to decouple from each other in order to have a more robust signal at the end. And I think a uh, uh, dropout was, um, was patented. OK, so dropping, dropping out is something very important, and all deep learning uh, architectures are having, this, uh, are having these layers of dropout. Um, now, again, loading the dropouts and fitting. The first fitting is done for one particular reason. When you train a neural network, uh, there is something called a learning rate. How learning happens with neural networks is this. 
I show you the picture of a cat. Uh, I suppose we have only two examples, cats and trees. I show you the picture of a cat. All the weights are random initially, and it outputs tree. I say bad. But when I say bad, I'm actually saying there is an error between your prediction of a tree and your actual prediction that should have been a cat, right? So there is an error here. And what neural networks do is they say this entire process is continuous, so it's dif differentiable. What that means is when you have an error here, you can backpropagate the error and assign blame to each neuron along the way. Does that make sense? Yeah? It's like you made the mistake, but I can tell you each step of the way where you made the mistake. So this error from cat can backpropagate through the network. And all the weights that were bad are adjusted. Right? OK, so you know you have to update, update them, but you don't know about how much. If you update them too much, what happens is this. Suppose your error is this. You start somewhere here, and you want to get here. Here is the point of lowest error, where most of your examples are correct. And the way a neural network does is it makes small steps going towards the error, right? And the learning rate is how big this step can be. If this step is very small, it takes a lot of time, or it can get stuck in local minima. If it's too big, it can explode, right? So what, it, what, this, what he is doing here, again, a new development, um, very recent, last year or something, is saying, hey, we're going to use it once, and we're going to see which is the best learning rate we should use. Not too big, not too small. So, and this is like a big uh, parenthesis about deep learning. So it's a black art. Nobody knows exactly uh, what should work. Uh, a lot of these uh, things and ideas come from experienced people experimenting all sorts of ideas. And this one was about, OK, we should not set a learning rate ourselves. We should uh, use a process to automatically detect we should be the le best learning rate. And they already have this, I don't know, 30% accuracy for the data set after one iteration. And they're going to save the, uh, the model. And they're going to find uh, the learning rate again. Um, the learning rate should be uh, set to a specific criteria. I'm not going to go into detail how. But what they do, they say, OK, go and do 15 iterations over the entire data set. One iteration is usually called an epoch. And what they did was, OK, they did an entire run and they got from 28% to 31% accuracy. But this is not the accuracy of the entire model. This is, um, this is just the, um, the accuracy for finding the, so sorry. Um, I believe this is the accuracy of, predicting the next word. And uh, what has happened, they looked at it, and this is how the error goes down over time, which is good. Now it is the head that we are interested in. So um, again, they're doing the same thing. This is the classifier, finally. So the classifier, th this is when they actually create their final model. Uh, they're setting the backpropagation, embedding size, the number of layers. Um, they're setting all sorts of the options for the optimizer. The optimizer is the function that uh, decides how to move the, the weights. Um, and um, now they let it train. It takes a minute. Anyway, after about after a while, I don't know exactly how much, they come up with 92% accuracy. And this is the IMDB uh, data set. Let's look. I, I just want to see uh, what the average is for this problem. 
I should just write the paper. Okay. So apparently the highest you can go is 94%, right? And the sentiment, sorry, is this the paragraph vector? Yeah, sorry, um, getting a bit tired here. So, yeah, they were getting 92% after one iteration, and then they leave it a couple of more iterations, and they get 94%, which is state of the art for this data set. So this is proving that language models can learn a lot because they're using context and they can predict the next word. And just by adding the extra stuff at the end, they are breaking state of the art. Questions? Sorry, it, it was a bit long, sorry. Um, so for for so, so probably it would perform better from so if you'd start with random embeddings and learn them and having a lot of Romanian text, even starting with English embeddings would would give you like a big boost forward. Does that make sense? So it could save you a, a lot of processing work, but you need to uh, unfreeze all the layers and let them modify. Yes. So I should at the end what the result of the layer at end of the layer or is the last So yeah, the, this is a what they did is this. They removed the last layer, they froze the weights, they add in an extra layer, they trained the extra layer, they unfroze the, the weights, they trained again, and then they trained again. Yes, I know, it's complicated because uh, what happens is if you do let it train it will just ma mess everything up. So all the knowledge that is in there would just be destroyed. So you need to freeze them, um, let it go close to where it is, and then unfreeze them, and then fine tune it. Yes. Yes, it's complicated, I know. The last layer is really a softmax. Yeah, the last layer is usually a softmax. Yeah, I think of it as, as the first part, as basically a feature interaction part. Um, yes, I have seen that as well. I don't know how good they are. <coughs> yeah. So this one is this, the uh, UML fit model. Yeah. I know, I, this could just be an extractive uh, uh, representation. So it has a softmax layer, and it has the pre-training, fine-tuning, and classifier fine-tuning, the what you have asked, right? Uh, I haven't seen this uh, in their original paper, so maybe it's just someone who created it to, to help himself, yeah. Okay, let's see. So as a quick summary, we went over basic NLP tasks. We looked at basic machine learning stuff, and I know I've only talked about deep learning, but I think you, you get kind of like a sense where all of this is going. Um, NLP takes us this far, machine learning takes us this far, deep learning takes us this far. They all have pros and cons. The pros of deep learning is that you have very good results. The con is is hard to understand and it's very finicky and when stuff goes wrong and you just don't know where you, you can modify it in order to to fix it. Um, yeah, this is all I have to show you. Thank you very much. <laughs>